Uh, it was a, a nice connection I made with uh, with Ron. So I'm happy to uh, to connect with your historical society. And um, I actually have never I've been to Sharon Springs a long time ago, but I look forward to uh, now that I know some people there. I look forward to connecting when we're all back to to traveling. So I'm based here in Rochester, so just kind of on the other side of the state. Um, and uh, I'll do a little intro about myself um, when I share my screen. I've got about a 50 minute presentation that we'll go through, um, a lot of slides and some video um, about archival storage for your family heirlooms, um, you know, a, a big focus on photographs, but also on objects um, and other three dimensional things too. So, um, and then we'll open it up for questions at the end. So Ron will, um, I think be uh, tracking the chat. So if you've got questions as I go, just pop them into the chat um, whenever during the presentation and then Ron will um, go through those at the end. So we'll hopefully um, get to all your questions and, and I will certainly um, leave my contact information at the end as well. So if you um, want to get in touch afterwards, be happy to chat about your project um, or any particular particular questions. Kate? So uh, yeah, so, well, what's up? Yeah, if people don't know how to chat, go to the very bottom of your screen and there's a little chat button there. And if you click on that, you'll be able to type your chat or your questions into that chat box and I'll collect those for Kate at the end. Great. Okay, sounds good. So I'm gonna share my screen and start because I've got um, a lot to get through. It's a lot of information. Um, so hopefully you'll be you'll, you'll get the link afterwards and go back and, and review it uh, at your leisure as well, kind of as you're working on projects. So let me share my screen and we'll get started. Okay, and I wanna present. Okay, is everybody seeing this? Ron, are you good? Can you see yes. my screen? We're good? Okay, great. Yep. All right, so this is the title of my uh, my talk for tonight, Museum Quality Storage for Family Heirlooms. Nope. Let's see, get through here. We're gonna, I'll do a brief introduction. Um, I like to go into a little bit of detail about what I call a project roadmap. Um, we'll talk a little bit about archival science and what makes things archival, what makes storage materials archival. And then we'll spend the bulk of the time talking about uh, storage and closures for, for photos and family heirlooms, and then um, hopefully have time for some Q&A at the end. So a quick introduction. This is a presentation I gave um, at a conference a couple of years ago. This is uh, my background here. So I love talking about archival storage, um, mostly because I spent about 13 years working in the museum field. Um, and most of that time I was working directly with collections, with the objects, you know, making sure they were stored correctly, purchasing storage materials, packing them for loans, um, consulting with conservators about treatment plans, uh, just to name a few things. So these are all the places I've worked, uh, and they range from the Smithsonian with its kind of vast resources to places where I was one of three employees. So I know firsthand the challenges of providing kind of adequate collection storage, um, you know, when you have you know, not a great budget. So <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll talk about that tonight. Currently, uh, my main position is uh, the director of membership for an organization called the Photo Managers, and that is kind of the national trade association for the photo organizing industry. Um, and I actually have my own photo organizing business as well called the Photo Curator. Um, I started that about five years ago. So I basically provide collections management services to families in terms of kind of digitizing their photo collections and managing their family heirlooms and things. Um, but now I also do um, membership uh, uh, for the actual kind of industry association um, and helping other folks uh, kind of launch their own businesses in this industry. But alongside this, um, for about three years now, I have been the marketing coordinator for a company called Archival Methods. And Archival Methods is based here in Rochester. Um, it's a firm about 16 years old that provides archival storage and presentation supplies to everyone from museums to libraries, galleries, businesses, um, artists, and then individuals uh, like us kind of working with their family heirlooms. And uh, it's a great little company. All of our boxes, binders, and portfolios are manufactured right here in Rochester. Um, and so all the images you'll see today uh, are archival methods products, um, just because I have access to, you know, everything kind of that we that we make. It just, it makes sense to kind of fill my presentation with that. But I do want to say that most of these items that I'll, you'll be seeing tonight are also available from a number of other reputable archival suppliers. So I'm always happy to provide information about where else you can find things. So before we go into details about archival storage, I wanna step back for a minute. 
So we're all here because we love family history. And that usually means that we all have a lot of stuff, whether that's just photos or we've got some family heirlooms mixed in. And it really makes sense to have a plan for dealing with the different stages of a project like this. Um, so setting some goals and outlining the steps can really help keep you on track because these projects, um, as you know, can get overwhelming very quickly. So I've developed this roadmap that I call the four D's of your kind of family preservation project. So decide, document, digitize, and then determine a storage plan. So this framework can help you break down a project into kind of manageable chunks. And so I'll just go through each step a little more in detail here. So deciding what to keep, this is the first step. So thinking about your goals for a project, um, what photos and objects support the goals you have or the, that best represent your family and the stories you wanna share? Uh, you know, what's the legacy you wanna leave? Kind of the big picture questions about, about all of your things. Do you wanna pass on some heirlooms? Are you looking to display some of your favorite things? Are you preparing things to send to a local historical society? So sorting and organizing well at the beginning is so important. Um, and this helps you determine how much documentation needs to happen, what your storage needs will be, really helps you plan out the rest of the project. And you wanna prioritize work um, with kind of, you know, the most important things first, the most fragile things, um, kind of whatever, um, you know, plays into those project goals. So step two is documenting what you have, capturing what you know about your photos and your objects. Um, obviously the dates and the people and the events are the most important things. Um, uh, what I like to call provenance, it's a museum term for kind of the history of an object. So say a family heirloom that's in your possession, how did you get it and where did it come from? Who's owned it before and what are the stories attached to it? Um, you can make notes on photos and pencil. You can save notes in boxes with your objects. You can even record some video on your phone about the things you have. Um, writing down the stories is really the key here too. Obviously, the, you know, the details about photos and objects, but the stories is what brings them alive and is what going, is going to kind of contribute most to your legacy uh, moving forward. Um, so the, and also this information is, um, this is stuff that can be saved in the metadata of digital images as well. And I won't get into too much about that, um, but it's something that um, you can embed uh, information about, about the people and the dates and, and who took the photo. Um, all those details um, can be embedded into uh, kind of the, um, the files behind the photo, if you will, the metadata, and, and kind of stay with those digital images. So there's lots of ways to document um, kind of the, the information and the stories about your um, your family heirlooms. And actually, if you want to get into some really good detail, you can use a spreadsheet, just something Excel or even a, a Google sheet um, to help you organize the information um, even, even in more detail. If you want to include uh, things like dates, you know, people that it's related to, that your objects are related to, sizes, even the condition of your objects, all very important. This is great information to save. Um, especially if you're thinking that things might go on to um, a historical society or other organization um, kind of after you're gone. So step three in uh, this project roadmap is digitization. Um, so the benefits of digitizing your photographs and heirlooms are great. So by scanning photos and photographing or videoing objects, you are creating a backup of them um, and you make for easy sharing with family and friends. Um, I want to say the most important point here is that as you're digitizing, please back up your files. Um, all that work uh, should not be should not be lost, and it's not a matter of when your hard drives or your computer will fail. I'm sorry, it's not a matter of if they will fail; it's a matter of when. <laughs> so, uh, I always recommend um, at least two, if not three, backups of your information, or having a, an original plus two backups of your information is kind of a best practice. Um, I've got a picture here of a, a really kind of basic workhorse flatbed scanner. This is an Epson scanner. Um, and if you're looking for kind of a reasonably priced intro flatbed scanner, this is a great choice. Um, you want to scan images, um, you know, whether it's photos or documents um, in a minimum of 300 DPI. Um, so this, you know, certainly can be daunting for a lot of folks who haven't ventured into digitizing, um, you know, your photos yet. So there is help available. Um, so that organization that I told you I was the membership director of called the Photo Managers, 
Um, so we are an association of folks who do this for other people. So photo organizers or photo managers is actually a job and, and you can hire somebody to help you deal with all this. Um, you can either have them do part of your project. So say you wanted to have someone help with the scanning and then you wanted to work on the storage of your things yourself, or they can do all of it for you. Um, lots of ways to, to handle that. So there is help available if you're feeling overwhelmed, especially about this digitizing part. Um, so the uh, photos are easy to scan, certainly, but, you know, 3D objects and family heirlooms, you also want to make sure that you record, um, you know, some images of them. And so I mentioned before that taking video is one way to do that, you know, certainly with your phone, um, you get the benefit of kind of narration about the object, you can talk about it as you're taking video. Um, and, but really a good photo on a neutral background like this, just with some, some blank paper or a blank background kind of behind it, um, against, you know, a, or near some natural light is really a great way to take some, some basic but, um, but good photos of, of your objects as well. Um, and certainly this does not work as well for, you know, large things, paintings or, or furniture, but, you know, even an image of them kind of in place is better than nothing. So a few ways to kind of document the 3D objects in your collection. And then step four is determining a storage plan. So we consider storage kind of in the both the physical realm and the digital realm. Um, so boxes or binders certainly are great ways to store the hard copies of your photos or to store the objects that you have. And then on the digital side of things, uh, we talked about kind of having the appropriate backups for, um, for all of your image files. So we want to talk about storage in both of those realms. They are kind of go hand in hand. And then sharing is kind of the really the fun part of the project and really gets to the heart of the goals that you have for the project. Why are you doing this? Who is this for? How do you want to share it with them? You know, are you creating online galleries? Are you creating photo books or video slideshows for a milestone family event? There's so many ways to share pictures. And especially when you have things digitized, it's very easy to pull those together, to get help pulling those together. And to get these pictures and these stories, most importantly, the stories kind of back into um, kind of, you know, circulation with your family. So starting a project, um, as you're, this is just an example of, uh, this was when I, a client project I was working on, and this was just the slides and all the, uh, the film reels and things that, that came with this project. And so I took a nice little before picture of this, so um, kind of neatly organized, but uh, certainly a lot to uh, to delve into there. So if you're starting your own kind of family uh, heirloom project, organizing and, and figuring out what you wanna keep, you wanna create a safe workspace. Um, you wanna hopefully have room to maneuver, have room to kind of leave things out if needed. Um, if you kind of, we see this as an ongoing project. So if you've got a place out of the way that you can keep things in process, that would be great. Um, never have food or drink. Um, even water is not great to have around your workspace. Just kind of keeping that all separate is, um, is a best practice. And this picture here are just some handy tools to, um, to collect as you're working on your project. Um, you kind of a magnifying glass for identifying things. Um, for Let's see, uh, we've <laughs> post-it notes, you know, note-taking things, um, the gloves, we'll talk about gloves in a minute, um, things for labeling and organizing, the envelopes and those little dividers. Um, the little craft spatula there is one way to kind of um, carefully lift up the edge of a photo that's maybe stuck to an old um, album, those awful sticky page albums. And that actually that dental floss there is also another tool for potentially um, very carefully getting an image um, unstuck from one of those sticky pages. Um, you can use some, some wax dental floss to kind of carefully, um, you know, run under the corner of a picture and, and start to kind of saw away underneath at the adhesive. So just two tips there on trying to get those photos out of those magnetic albums, which should be a priority since they are terribly, terribly um, non-archival. <laughs> so collecting some tools and having these on hand will kind of make things go more smoothly as you are working on your project. So let's talk about gloves. Um, basically, the bottom line is when you're working with your photographs, it is a best practice to always wear a pair of gloves. Um, even if it, your hands are clean and it looks like you're not, you know, you're not only touching the edges, 
Um, it's still the oils from your hands will will still impact that photo. It looks like nothing is on there, but you know, in a hundred years, the evidence of that oil and that that fingerprint will be all over your photograph. And so, really, the best the best thing to do is to have either a cotton glove, um, a cotton kind of museum examination glove, or um, a nitrile glove, which we're all familiar with from our PPE experience of the past uh, year and a half. So. Um, these things are, you know, easy to find. Um, they're certainly available at any kind of archival supplier. The nitro gloves, obviously, um, you know, from Amazon or from from Target, probably at this point. So, uh, best practice to wear gloves for photographs, and also if you're handling um, paintings for any amount of time. And leather and metal objects also are very susceptible to damage from the oils on your hands. Um, but for everything else, so ceramics and glassware and textiles um, and things like that, uh, books and paper, um, bare hands are fine for that. Just wash your hands before and that you actually you have better dexterity without the gloves. And so handling, you know, things like ceramics and glass and china and paper um, that can crumble easily um, is better to do with bare hands. But I will, the bottom line here is if you've got photos, um, you should have a pair of gloves as you're working on them. And as you're going through your collection, you may run across kind of photos or objects that are, are not in great shape. Um, and if something that could, if it's something that can be digitized and then um, the image, the digital image can then be corrected, that's an easy fix. But there are some things that you may want the original uh, repaired. And in that case, you want to talk to what's called a conservator, a professional conservator. It's somebody who's been trained in the repair and restoration of kind of cultural heritage materials. Um, they, they would specialize in books or paper or photographs or paintings or or objects. So um, at the end, I'll share a link for, oh no, I have it here, sorry. So this um, website here, culturalheritage.org is the website for the National Association for um, uh, kind of uh, American Institute for Conservation, which is the National Conservators Association. And there's a link right there on the, the homepage called Find a Conservator. And there is an easy search tool to plug in your location or the type of um, object that you want to have uh, repaired. And, um, you know, really best to have a professional deal with uh, your most valuable heirlooms if you're looking to have something um, fixed or restored. So I've got a couple storage tips here quickly, um, if, especially uh, concerning papers. You often find, uh, you know, these things with photographs too, but photographs and papers and 2D objects uh, often come with, you know, paper clips and pins and staples and all kinds of weird attachments. And you want to remove all those things, rubber bands to um, anything that's going to degrade and cause damage to your papers or your photos over the long term. Um, you want to take them off um, before they're stored. And you want to unfold and flatten any papers that you have to um, paper so often tears first at the creases, you want to try to avoid long term storage uh, of creased paper. Um, and you know this goes for newspapers, it actually goes for textiles as well, um, you know the fibers of the of the textile are you know weaken at the creases too and that's the first place that they often tear as well. Um, and then also rolled items. I'll talk about rolled items a little bit at the end too, but I know lots of people have those, um, you know, very long, uh, uh, what do I call it? Um, group photos from kind of, you know, the teens and the twenties and then they're often rolled very tightly. And so the more you can store them flat, uh, the better it will be for things. And you want to think about storing kind of like with like types of things. Um, you know, when you're storing photos, if they're in good condition, it's totally fine to stack a bunch of photos together. You don't need anything in between them. Um, kind of storing like types of prints with like. You can see in this picture here, I've got some, um, some black and white prints in one box here. Um, up in the top, I've on the left hand side, I've got some stereo cards. The, or cabinet cards, sorry, that are all stored together. Um, and then in the bottom uh, left corner, you can see a little cased photo kind of in a bag there. We'll talk about those in more detail, but kind of storing like types of photos with like. And then when you're storing objects, thinking about like with like in terms of weight. So you wanna make sure that you've got, you know, kind of all the delicate things in one box and kind of heavier things that weigh the same or about the same size in another box. So just kind of basic packing, uh, packing common sense, but but worth uh, worth mentioning. 
And then inventorying and labeling your boxes. This is really critical. Um, at the very least, a label on the outside of the box describing what's in it is a, so important. Um, and even better is an inventory of what's inside. And this can be written. This can be a copy of maybe a spreadsheet that you made. It can be some photographs. You, know, you can keep it just inside the top of the box. Um, the whole point here is that the better the label, the less you'll have to open the box and kind of handle all the objects or the photos to see what's in there. So you want a quick identification of everything that's in there and uh, just makes it uh, easier and safer for, um, for storing things for the long term. All right, I wanna just talk briefly about some archival storage basics here. This is a little bit, um, delve into the science a little bit here. Um, let's see, so Technically, archival storage means that you are storing or displaying photos and objects in containers that won't do them any harm, that will really help preserve them. So regular cardboard boxes or you know, a cheap binder are made of materials that over the long term are gonna cause damage to your photos and your objects. And this damage can include discoloration, deterioration, like physical deterioration, or even destruction, uh, mold growth, pest infestation, nothing that you want to have happen to your heirlooms. So these are just some of the terms, the most common archival terms that you'll see, um, and, and some information about helping you make some storage decisions. So you wanna make sure that the paper or the cardboard in your archival storage materials is acid free. It's a pretty common term now. I think most people kind of know what this means. Um, acids are naturally occurring in wood pulp, of course, that makes you know commercial paper. And if it's not removed during the paper making process, it stays in the paper. Um, and then as these acids react to moisture and even just general humidity in the air, they react and begin to deteriorate um, the paper or the cardboard and it affects what you're storing in it. So acid-free paper um, has, a, has a pH, obviously a kind of neutral pH between six and seven. Um, if it's unbuffered, um, and then there's a type of paper called buffered paper, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And that has a little bit higher, it's a little bit alkaline, and it's got a pH of about eight to 10. So um, you'll hear about those. Those are both acid-free papers, but one of them actually veers more into the alkaline. So acid-free is a, a term that you'll wanna make sure that you um, are seeing on your storage materials. And lignin-free is another common archival term um, that people are, are pretty, pretty familiar with these days, but I wanted to just show you kind of what lignin is actually. It's an important part of the, of the structure of wood. It forms um, part of the cell walls of wood, um, but as the molecules, the lignin molecules are exposed to oxygen, they become less stable and absorb more light and give off a darker color. And this is actually what causes the yellowing of paper. Um, so during the pulping process of archival quality paper, the lignin gets removed. So that's what the term lignin free means. And there's a whole scale to measure this. And um, you want to, you know, technically you want a, a lignin free paper that has a kappa number of less than five, but nothing you need to remember, but just know that lignin free is an, another important aspect of archival um, paper and kind of archival um, box board. So you'll often see references to buffered or unbuffered um, archival storage papers, cardboards, and tissue paper. Um, so we talked about the, the pH of those papers uh, just a couple of slides ago, how unbuffered paper has a neutral pH of six to seven, and then a, a buffered paper has calcium carbonate added during the the production, and that is what bumps that pH of, of buffered paper into the alkaline territory. And what this is, the importance of this here is that this calcium carbonate actually kind of actively neutralizes other acids in the environment that would normally make any other paper just stay acidic. So acids can migrate from a neighboring box, from a shelving unit, from things that you're storing in um, the box, and, you know, they come there kind of in the atmosphere in general. And so if you've got a buffered box or buffered papers right next to your materials, um, they will actively kind of absorb those acids um, kind of coming off of your materials or in the environment or coming off of just, you know, storage boxes um, and really actively help preserve um, your, your photos or your objects. So it's important to find buffered paper. Um, we'll get into the details here in a sec. Um, so the uh, the unbuffered paper is uh, uh, sorry. 
losing my place here. Okay, so most items in your family history collection, so paper and photographs and most objects benefit from storage um, in that buffered enclosure, like I just mentioned, that, that actively absorbs damaging acids um, kind of in the environment and helps keep things acid free. Um, you know, textiles, photographs, papers, I mentioned all those. So um, if you're black and white prints, color prints, buffered paper is the way to go, buffered enclosures. I do want to mention some exceptions here, though. So there's two very specific types of photographic prints that are actually harmed by that, that higher pH uh, buffered paper. And these are called dye transfer prints. And then they're also um, cyanotypes, which are sometimes referred to as sun prints on that, on that blue paper. And in those two specific cases on the photographic side of things, you want to use unbuffered paper. Um, and those, along those lines, if you're storing blueprints, some people might have some blueprints um, in their collections. Those also, because of the, the blue kind of cyano dye in them, need to be stored in unbuffered paper. Um, every Anything else photographic wise is fine in a buffered enclosure. And then I do want to mention that anything that contains animal proteins should also be stored in unbuffered enclosures, um, or at the very least kind of wrapped in an unbuffered paper if you're storing it in a buffered box. So this include animal proteins in terms of objects includes um, things like silk, feathers, wool, leather, pearl, horsehair. Um, I, so I have the image here of a, of a quilt in a textile box because textiles and personal accessories are kind of often where you find these animal proteins uh, and where you want to use an, an unbuffered tissue to wrap them or unbuffered box. Um, so a crazy quilt here like this one would often be a mix of fabrics and if there was silk in that mix, even if the rest of the fabrics were cottons and linens, um, kind of non-animal proteins, you'd still want to wrap that quilt in an unbuffered tissue um, because of the animal proteins in the silk. So a little sidebar there for this unbuffered versus buffered papers. <clears throat> so moving on from paper and board here, plastic is another archival storage option. So there's three kinds of plastics that are um, called, are considered inert and suitable for long-term preservation. And these are polyester, polyethylene, and polypropylene. And you'll see these in you know, various um, uh, you know, clarities and stiffness and, and types of plastic. Um, mylar is a brand name for uh, polyester. You'll see that in a lot of um, kind of archival storage uh, uh, products. Um, polypropylene comes in kind of the most uh, different levels of kind of clarity and stiffness. And actually even some of the the big storage bins from a from a from you know Target or Walmart, um, uh, you know a Rubbermaid bin or Iris or Sterilite, those type of bins um, often are 100% polypropylene, and so actually are appropriate if you need kind of large size archival storage. You really want to stay away from anything that has the the letters the abbreviations PVA or PVC. Those are um, those have vinyl, you know, polyvinyl chloride is PVC. Anything with vinyl in the name is, is not an archival plastic, so you want to stay away from that. Um, and I just I put the recycling numbers up here. Archival suppliers certainly don't really use recycling numbers as part of their, um, of their uh, classification, but I just wanted to show how it kind of puts plastics in perspective. Um, you know, so one, uh, one there, PET is polyester, um, two and four are versions of polyethylene, and then number five is polypropylene. So these three archival plastics exist for a lot of other, um, you know, resources in our life, but they are also the ones that would be um, commonly used, and we'll see all different types of enclosures in a few minutes here, made out of these three plastics. <laughs> I want to jump into just a quick measurement term here that you'll see, especially when you're dealing with the with the plastics and different kinds of archival storage. So the the, the term mill is uh, kind of more of an industrial rather than an archival term, but it's used to measure plastics. Um, so most plastic enclosures that the archival method sells or any other supplier sells range between 1.5 and 4 mil, and a mil is a thousandth of an inch, so it's used to measure the thickness of the plastic. So if you kind of compare 30 mil is about the thickness of a credit card. So these enclosures are you know, much thinner than that, but they come um, when you've got a 1.5 mil kind of plastic sleeve or plastic envelope here in one hand, and then a you know, three or four mil example of something in another hand, you can very much tell the difference. Um, so if you, for a little bit more rigid protection from a plastic enclosure, you want a little bit higher mil measurement. 
So I do want to mention also that besides the material composition, the design of storage is another element that makes it archival. Um, and you can see this most clearly in boxes here. So these common, um, these are pretty common archival boxes from really any kind of supplier. Um, they've got metal edges here that um, really help with the rigidity of the box and, and, and help the stacking strength of these boxes. So you can be sure that whatever you're putting in them, even if you stack a few boxes high, is not going to crush, you know, the box won't collapse on a side and crush what you're storing. So those metal edges are a very important archival component. And also on these boxes here, you can see what's called a drop front side. So it's, you know, three of the sides are all attached. And then this fourth side here full is scored and folds down. And that is for, you know, easy and safe access of, of a stack of things that you've stored in this box. So you've got a stack of photographs or of documents or something. Um, and if you if you had all four sides of the box, like a regular box, um, you know, together, you'd have to really jam your fingers down the side to kind of lift out what you know what was in there and, and how do you flip through them. But if this drop front gives you much easier access and allows for safer handling of what you've stored in there. So another kind of very archival specific design element. So Really what it comes down to, you know, I went through a lot of details um, of this archival uh, storage here and a lot of numbers you don't need to remember, you don't need to remember pH or, or you know, <laughs> any of, you know, the Kappa test for, uh, for LinkedIn or anything. But what I do want you to know is that um, when you're buying archival storage supplies, uh, you really should buy from a supplier that lists out the specifications for the products that they're selling. You know, lots of big box stores and especially the craft stores will sell supplies that are just labeled acid free or photo safe, but you really, you know, there's no description beyond that of the actual specs. And so you just can't trust that. Um, so it's much, you know, if you're going to invest money in archival storage, it's really uh, a better idea to go with a reputable archival supplier who's providing you the information. This image here is just a quick screenshot of, um, of the type of detail that you'll find on Archival Methods website. Um, any of the other archival suppliers have all of the same kind of detail. Um, so you just, you, un you know that they have tested their products and that you're getting uh, actually true archival products. So the more information there is, uh, the more you can trust uh, the products. So that was a quick overview of kind of the properties of archival storage materials. And just as important as the materials is the environment that they are stored in, that the objects or the photos are stored in. So we like to, in the kind of the archival field here, like to define this environment as layers of protection. Um, so the more layers surrounding an object, the less chance it's gonna be affected by physical forces, by light, by dust, by pests, all the things that, that kind of will harm it and cause quicker deterioration. Um, so, you know, the more layers equals the more stable environment. And so, so each successive layer that you kind of wrap something in and place something, you know, place an object in kind of further stabilizes its environment. So let's start kind of macro here. So the top layer of protection really for, the, for your family family heirlooms is your home, right? So it's structure, the systems inside it. Um, you want to store family heirlooms in a climate controlled area um, that's got a stable temperature of about 60 to 75 degrees. It's okay if it fluctuates in that range, but you know, it shouldn't have kind of major fluctuations uh, beyond that range. And also the humidity range um, that's most ideal is about 35 to 55%. Um, so this in this house image here, the grayed out portions like the attic, the garage and the basement are all places you should never store family heirlooms. Um, most often those places are not climate controlled and the, the fluctuation in the temperature and the humidity is just too great and just lends to uh, kind of a more quick or a more much more quick deterioration of, um, of your items. Uh, so the next layer that we talk about is the storage equipment. So a cabinet, um, are you storing them in a closet? Um, a high shelf is a great place to store things, kind of away from any um, flood damage. You want to make sure you're storing something kind of not under a bathroom or where there's a chance of a leak, a water leak. Um, and then we talk about the container level. So the boxes or the bins, you know, we talked about those polypropylene sterilite bins. They're an appropriate type of archival storage. Um, you know, the, that's the container level of storage. And then finally, there's the individual enclosure level. And so those last two, the storage container and the enclosures is what we're going to dig a little bit deeper into. So making storage decisions. As I mentioned before, um, 
the layers of protection kind of ending at the container level uh, is sometimes all you need is a box, right? Um, it's often a perfectly fine solution. Uh, the box is Itself is excellent protection from light and from dust and from pests and from you know physical force, especially if you've got the metal edge box. It gives it some really great stability. Um, but sometimes uh, your objects need a little extra protection, and that's where the individual enclosures, um, which is what you'd place an object or a photo into before you put it in the box, sometimes that is required. Um, and you know, not every object in your collection is going to need an individual enclosure. Um, and as you're doing your initial sort or kind of going through your, your things, it's a good time to kind of flag the items that you think may need some extra protection or that you want to just investigate further. And so I wanted to kind of give you some things to keep in mind when you're assessing the need for kind of individual enclosures um, to help you plan uh, your storage and plan your purchases. Um, so I'm going to go through a couple of details here, considering the object, you want to consider its condition, what information you have about it, the value, and then how you're going to access it. So considering the object, so take a look at the things that you have, and, and these are some items that, that usually require a little bit extra protection with that individual enclosure before you put them in the box here. So negatives certainly are easily um, scratched and damaged, and, she, and then really are, because they're such an important original of the photos that you have, um, they, I mean, they are the original, right? And so they really um, are, are easy to protect from, from this damage and should be stored in their own kind of enclosure. Um, vintage cased photographs, you know, ambrotypes or daguerreotypes, um, they should also have their own enclosures. Often that case is very delicate and can be easily harmed, but it also can scratch things it's being stored next to. So you want to kind of protect other things from it. Um, tin types kind of fall into that category as well. Uh, newspapers, of course, are kind of the worst kind of acidy offenders. I've got a slide about that later. 100% they should be stored by themselves in individual enclosures. You do not want that terrible newsprint acid kind of spread through your collection. Um, we talk about friable media, um, which just means that, that uh, whatever the, the media is kind of crumbles easily and flakes off of the paper. So examples of this are chalk, pastel, charcoal, um, drawings or artwork, tempera paint, which is often used for kids' artwork projects. Um, I include pencil here because it doesn't flake as much, maybe like pastels, but it's certainly the slightest touch can smudge pencil. So all that friable media really benefits from an individual enclosure before you box it up. And then uh, fragile books and, photo and albums, photo albums, scrapbooks. They can usually benefit from some kind of additional enclosure besides a box as well, um, if for no other reason than to keep all the pages together, keep the ephemera from kind of falling out. Um, often those are, are kind of uh, <laughs> kind of haphazardly kept together when they're when they're very vintage. Um, and you know, uh, an enclosure uh, can also kind of keep um, contain crumbling bits of a spine or um, or paper. The pages of the paper um, often are kind of crumbling too. So, fragile books and photo albums uh, really benefit from individual enclosures as well. And then finally, letters. I have a slide about this too. But um, you know, if you've got envelopes with your letters and, and a whole series of them, you want to keep the envelopes with the appropriate letter. We'll talk about ways to do that as well. The next thing you want to consider is the condition of the object, and this is something else that will help you determine, um, you know, what needs a little bit of extra storage, right? Um, is something especially damaged or fragile? It needs extra support to prevent it from, you know, further uh, deterioration. Is something dirty? Um, and here I consider um, kind of sticky album residue on the back of photos, or if they're grimy, or if they've got tape or kind of grimy tape on them. Something's tried to be fixed in the past. Um, those are all things that are just kind of, you know, uh, dirt and debris on things. And you want to keep that, um, if, you know, if you're not cleaning them or having a professional clean them, you want to keep them separated uh, so that doesn't spread to other items. And then if things are moldy, uh, it's certainly always a problem as well. You'll know if there's a kind of a current mold infestation, uh, you'll have that smell and you'll kind of feel it. You know, you, it's certainly not hard to tell when there's when there's active mold around. 
Uh, and these things require special handling, especially if it's a, um, kind of an invasive or pervasive to um, you know many photos or objects in your collection. Um, you want to certainly isolate something that's moldy in a sealed bag to start, and this can even be a Ziploc bag. It doesn't need to be archival right off the bat. Um, and take this to a professional conservator to deal with kind of the cleaning and uh, mitigation of the mold. So nothing you want to deal with on your own for sure. You want to think about how things will be accessed uh, as you're determining kind of you know the extra storage that you'll need for your things. Um, so if you've got some, you know, if you've got things you want to access frequently and, and things that are easy to kind of flip through, photos and, and letters maybe are easy things to store in a binder and they're, you know, can be on a shelf and pulled down and, and in, in the, the actual originals can be enjoyed easily. Um, but if you're digitizing everything and uh, want to just put it away kind of in long term safe storage as, as your original backup of everything, boxes are often the most efficient way to do that, um, to have that long term safe storage. You want to think about its value too. Um, you know, usually photos or objects um, have been that have been handed down, you know, have some value. Um, certainly there's um, there might be some historical value, some monetary value. A lot of it is often just sentimental value to the family, but understanding, you know, what you have uh, in terms of value and, and what things are, you know, uh, you know, most special to you and, and most important to be protected in the, in the best way possible, that will help you make some purchasing decisions about, you know, how much, how many layers of protection and how much, you know, kind of extra storage things will need. And then is there a story to record? Um, you know, items that have this higher sentimental or historical value often have stories attached, right? And so this is the kind of information we talked about recording when we talked about documenting your project. Um, and you wanna actually, you know, it's easy to do with the metadata. We talked about that type of information kind of being attached to a digital image, but this can also be saved with your um, with your hard copies, your originals of things and with your um, the, the objects themselves. And so a support or enclosure um, provides space to write information, important information about the you know the photos or the objects. And so we'll show you a few examples of that. All right, so now going into individual enclosures, we'll do a quick time check here, 743. Oh my gosh, this is like we're flying by here. So we're gonna go through pretty quickly. Um, Ron, are we okay if we go over a little bit, or do you want me to really um, make this about a you know five more minutes? Or no, go go ahead and and uh, I I don't want you to cut it short because it's great. Okay, okay, we'll get through this, and then I'm happy to stay on as long as we need for questions. So I understand if you need to pop off at eight, I apologize for going long. I just I uh, was adding a few things last minute to this. I thought you guys might be interested in so. Uh, we'll try to get through this quickly here. So now we're going to talk about some of the individual enclosures that. Um, are uh, that are going to kind of provide that extra storage that some of your objects might need here. Um, let's see. So we're going to talk about plastic enclosures first. So these are kind of the workhorses of archival storage um, for you know photos, for letters, for documents, for books, memorabilia. You can get plastic bags, plastic sleeves, plastic envelopes. Um, you can slide in a cardstock insert as a support in any kind of uh, you know plastic enclosure here and that just you know provides a little extra um, support for an object you can see here this um, cabinet card is being slid into a um, a little bag a plastic bag and it's got a cardstock insert which is now you're being able to handle the the edges of the cardstock insert and you're not actually having to handle the edges of the, uh, the cabinet card anymore. Um, that insert also provides a place to write a caption, write the information um, about the cabinet card. So plastic enclosure is just really handy uh, for so many different types of objects here. Um, I've got a quick video I'm going to play that shows you um, five different types of the, kind of the most common plastic enclosures and what you um, how you could use them.
All right, so now I've got a few examples here. I hope that was helpful. Um, I didn't uh, actually get a chance. I was prepping those videos for a, a, another presentation and did get a chance to record uh, kind of a narrative for them. So I hope the captions kind of explained everything as, as it went along here. So I just wanna go into a couple details about a few different types of objects and how I would use plastic enclosures for them. So tin types are a great example of of wanting, um, you know, kind of a softer, um, this is a, a high density polyethylene bag. It, it doesn't have as much clarity, but it's a little bit softer for that fragile tin type. And I would slide a, a, a cardstock insert um, behind that for a little extra support for the tin type. Um, case photos, we talked about those briefly. Again, you want to protect the, the cases that are often fragile, and you also want to protect um, anything else you're storing them with from being scratched by those cases, the hard edges of those cases. Um, so these guys benefit from um, being in, in kind of just an open polyethylene bag here. Um, very easy to store them. Film reels is another thing that people often have. And, and I recommend keeping the film actually in the original boxes and the canisters if you have them, because that's kind of part of the, the provenance of the, of the object and, and just easier to kind of contain the actual film in its original uh, container. But then you want to put each of those into a polyethylene bag to kind of keep the, you know, the acid -y cardboard box from, from affecting anything, anything else. Um, one little caveat here, um, you really want to digitize your film kind of as soon as possible. If you haven't done that already, this um, deteriorates much faster than photos and paper, obviously. Um, and if you ever smell vinegar while you're handling old film, if you, whatever kind of, you know, super eight or 16 millimeter, whatever kind of old home movies you have, um, that is uh, a sign of kind of very severe deterioration. And you would want to get that kind of handled by a conservator um, and, 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 and processed by some a professional. So but just be wary if you smell vinegar when you're dealing with your film, get that handled by somebody else. <laughs> you don't want to work on, on those yourself. Um, books and scrapbooks um, really benefit from being just uh, enclosed in, in a plastic bag here. And as I mentioned that in that video, um, you never want to seal these plastic enclosures um, because you don't want kind of any kind of damaging microenvironment to happen, a microclimate to occur. Um, you don't want moisture in there, can, you know, can, can, can fester some mold growth. And so even just um, folding over the top of one of these open-ended bags is just enough, um, you know, of a closure. So don't worry that they're not sealed. Um, you really do want that airflow um, of, you know, around these objects. And so uh, important to have those unsealed. So um, I think I have, oh, in a sec, I've got a video about um, storing kind of scrapbooks uh, in these, with these bags. But uh, as I mentioned before, newspapers and clippings, you definitely want to isolate them in their own individual bags, plastic bags. Um, they come in all different sizes. You can get ones that are obviously newspaper size. Um, you can uh, store your clippings in, in um, you know, any kind of plastic enclosure so they're visible, but they're separate and not spreading kind of all that terrible um, newspaper acid kind of to other things. And you want to make sure these two are scanned or copied before you store them because um, there's really, uh, this kind of paper is just so fragile. Um, it's never going to last kind of as long as you would imagine um, without yellowing. Um, so uh, important to get that digitized um, if you've got important newspaper clippings. Let's see, and this is a video about storing um, how to wrap kind of a, an album in a box and uh, using these plastic bags here. So you can see I was using some archival tissue to actually kind of pad the sides of the box. Um, you often are gonna have to find a box that maybe is a little bit larger than the thing you're trying to store. And so using some, some tissue crumpled up around the side is a great way to add some protection, add another layer of protection, as we say, and, and take up that empty space in a box. Um, and then you saw that I just folded over the top of that bag and that was enough of a closure to keep those um, kind of fragile books together. And that's the same treatment you could give to a scrapbook that has, you know, kind of of lots of pages and things kind of, you know, precariously falling out of the scrapbook. So containing all that in a plastic bag, just folding it closed and putting it in a box is a great way to store um, those tricky albums. 
So we'll quickly talk about some paper enclosures. Um, obviously, you're giving up the clarity of any of the plastic enclosures, but paper enclosures um, uh, are often much cheaper than plastic ones. You've got lots of room for labeling things, which is great. And they usually come in kind of envelopes or folders. Um, folders uh, can be just like the, you know, um, kind of three uh, manila folders that we find in office supply stores, but, you know, uh, but archival quality, which is great. Um, and this is good for vertical storage for sturdy items in good condition. So letters and papers and photos and things, um, as long as they're not uh, super fragile, uh, can be stored vertically in file folders. Not a problem there. Um, envelopes are certainly, um, you know, lots of different sizes and configurations. Um, you know, you can get them open on the short side, the long side. The one caveat for archival envelopes is you don't want any that have um, a seam down the center. You can see the ones in the image here have those seams on the sides. Um, a center seam is kind of more prone to collapsing, especially if things are stacked up. Several envelopes, you know, full of things are stacked up. That center seam can split and start to um, uh, damage the things that are inside it. So the, the side seams for archival envelopes are a little bit more important, are important to, to have. So something to keep in mind there. And we've got a lot of caddies. This is, um, you know, kind of ways to store uh, little things inside a box to section them off to help organize. Um, these are some slide caddies here that we sell at archival methods. Um, they're fantastic for slides that you want to take out of carousels, which is just, you know, talk about um, saving yourself some storage space, getting them into these boxes uh, really can tell it consolidates your storage. And, um, and these are obviously all archival, um, these little caddies. They're also great for small objects. If you've got um, you know, jewelry or pins or coins or something, organizing in these boxes with these small paper caddies um, is pretty efficient. And memorabilia and letters, um, very easy to, um, to put these in folders. This box here um, in the background of this image is called a document box. And so it's great storage um, for, these, for these file folders, for things that are in good shape, again, can handle being stored vertically. Um, and then you can interleave items with tissue. We'll talk about interleaving in a minute um, or put things into plastic sleeves for extra protection, but it's also just fine to put things in folders and kind of organize them in folders. So, you know, whatever um, kind of level of storage that you is in your budget, uh, it, it works. I have a, a mantra I like to say that, you know, any archival storage is better than none. So <laughs> you don't need to have, you know, specific enclosures for every single, single thing you're storing. It's certainly fine to put, you know, a bunch of things into one folder or one box. And, and that's a great, um, a great level of storage. Uh, negatives kind of have their own um, little folders um, for, from these archival suppliers, and um, you can place them in a plastic sleeve, and that sleeve can go inside uh, these little negative file folders. So they've got kind of two layers of protection there, and then they get popped into a box. Um, if you are taking the time to keep your collection of negatives, um, you know, if, if that's part of what you have to store, you might as well store them kind of the best way possible since they are the very best original of the photos you have. So um, if, if negatives are something you have, it's worth investing in um, some good storage with several layers of protection for them and lots of room to label what's on each, uh, you know, each uh, strip of negatives. And then modern prints, just your, your average four by sixes and five by sevens from, you know, the photo lab, everything we had from the, you know, 60s on. Um, we've got lots of boxes that fit these. Um, you can just put them all in a box in one, you know, big stack if they're in good condition. You know, if there's no sticky album residue on the back of one that's going to hit the back of the next, you know, you don't want that. Um, you can also get envelopes like this to help organize these within the boxes. Um, this is great if you've got information about, you know, you know, what the vacation was or who the people were or what role of film. This is just a really easy way to store um, kind of your more modern family photos. And then if you've got negatives that actually stayed with the with the rolls of, of, of prints or, you know, with the actual prints, the fantastic kudos to you. And so you can actually continue that with um, archival envelopes. We have them um, in archival methods for both five by sevens and four by sixes. And uh, with that little pocket in front, just like the photo lab uh, envelope, but it's archival. So if you're keeping them together, that's a great way to do it. 
And then larger prints, um, they can certainly be in a plastic sleeve. They can also be in an envelope. Um, you know, these are sometimes more fragile. They've been kind of handed around and the edges are, you know, kind of rough and crumbling. And so larger prints, vintage prints can often benefit from being inside another, you know, an individual enclosure and then stacked inside a box. So we talked a little bit about interleaving here. Um, this is just tissue or, or paper, archival paper um, that you wanna lay in between items that are stacked in a box. If you've got like a lot of prints or you know letters or documents and you wanna um, just have a little bit of protection for each one, you don't, wanna, you, you don't wanna purchase like an individual plastic sleeve for each one. You can still stack them up with a, um, with a piece of tissue in between each one. And that's a great layer of protection for them. Um, you can put them between items in a folder um, and our uh, interleaving tissue actually makes a great um, protection for the pages of a scrapbook or an album where you're keeping the photos on those pages if you're not taking apart the album and you want to save it as it is. Um, so, you know, it's got the kind of old acid pages, but you can put these, you know, a, a piece of tissue over that page, protect the photos from the, you know, the, the previous page it's laying on them. And, um, and it prevents you from having to kind of take apart the album to, uh, to save those photos. So here's an example of that here. So um, you can just see that this tissue was cut to, to size for this page and laid right over those photos and protecting it from, um, from the previous page. So a great way to, um, to kind of deal with an old photo album or scrapbook. But the one caveat here is you wanna do this only if the spine can support kind of the extra, the addition of those extra pages. So something to be careful about. Mm -hmm. And then we talk about rolled materials here. This is, um, you know, photographs, posters, certificates, textiles. Um, this is a little example of this image here of kind of um, laying the, you know, whatever you need to roll up again um, on some tissue and then rolling it with a tissue um, so that it kind of interleaves itself, I guess. I'm not explaining this super well, but you can kind of see from that picture how you're rolling it and protecting, um, you know, the tissue as it's rolled. And sometimes keeping things rolled is the best way to store them. Um, some of those old photographs, those old, um, you know, group photographs from like the 20s, uh, you know, you're never going to find a box big enough to store that flat, right? And it takes so much effort to kind of rehumidify a picture like that and get it to be really flat again, that honestly, keeping it rolled is sometimes the best option and the safest option and, you know, the most economical as well. So, but if you can add um, some tissue paper to, you know, unroll it and roll it back up again with that tissue inside it, it's just one more layer of protection. And then binder pages. We haven't really talked a lot about binders, but they are a great way to store things that you want to be able to, uh, to flip through more frequently and access more frequently. There are binder pages for all kinds of sizes of prints, um, as I'm sure you know, you know, from kind of full page protector, full page ones to, you know, these individual ones here, um, you know, for three by five slots and for, you know, four by six, five by seven. Um, Letters and envelopes are really easy to keep together if you're using page protectors here. Um, this is a great way to use binders. And um, I would put the letter in one page protector and I would either slip its envelope kind of behind it in the page protector, excuse me, or give the envelope its own separate page protector depending on kind of how much space you have. Um, and another thing actually with letters and envelopes, if you really want to ensure that they'll always be kind of related is that you can number them. So pick an ID number starting at one or whatever makes sense to you. And, and then in pencil on the reverse of each letter and envelope, just write a matching number. And so you'll know which always go together. And so this is a quick video about some binder pages here and just this, the different types of options.
So a quick intro about binders there. Um, I've just got a, two, like two more slides and one more quick video and then we'll wrap it up here. I appreciate your patience with all this. We haven't talked a lot about objects tonight, but you can certainly um, store them as a, you know, mixed in with your photos. If you have, you know, a little bit of each, you can see in this um, divided box here, there's some objects, um, you know, some small books there and some photos in that bottom right divider. Um, divided boxes are a great way to kind of organize things um, so that you've got little sections for different types of objects. Um, you can certainly just store objects by themselves in a box. Um, you always want to um, do, you know, wrap them in tissue or provide some padding as you're, as you're storing objects. Um, and again, uh, kind of labeling um, a box is important so that you're not having to kind of open a box and dig through all kinds of padding to see what was in there. So, and I've got one more video um, about a really, oh, why isn't it not going? Here we go. Um, this is a, a really kind of cool um, divided box that we offer at Archival Methods where you can kind of mix and match the inserts to fit what um, types of items you'd like to store. So this is our create a kit, which lets you kind of mix and match um, different inserts to really customize uh, a storage box. And the first section here is just um, all the elements that go into uh, the basic create kit. We have one pre-made option, and this is what comes in it. Note the first three caddies um, I've put in here. Uh, two of them have regular prints that are just fine stacked together without any separate enclosures. And one has stereo cards that are a little bit more fragile and each of them are in their own enclosure. And finally, these two fragile prints with acidy cardboard surrounds each get their own plastic sleeve and then are placed together in an envelope. All right, so we are finally to the end of all the information. I know that was kind of information overload. So hopefully you can go back and revisit at your leisure. I wanted to leave you with some links, um, Archival Methods website. Um, we have a fantastic kind of online preservation guide um, for family history projects. Um, you can also order a hard copy, but we have a, an online version there that that, um, that second link is a, is a quick link to the preservation guide you can download for free. Um, I wanted to give you the address of the photo managers if you're interested in, in kind of investigating some um, assistance with kind of digitizing your photos or dealing with, the, you know, more of the photo side of your collection. And then the, lastly, that is my email at Archival Methods, katej at archivalmethods.com. I love talking about storage projects. I'm happy to answer any more questions that came up from this. Um, and please get in touch if you want product recommendations or um, you know, how to store something, um, you know, happy to talk you through a project. So that is all I have for, I'm going to stop my screen share and I'm back to the video here. So, um, we went a little bit over, so thank you for your patience. Um, I'm happy to stay on for a little bit to take any questions or also understand if we need to wrap it up. So Ron, I'll, no. I'll leave, leave it to you here. Okay. So, uh, one question is, is regular tissue paper, okay um or do you have to have special tissue paper you if you're storing archival uh you know if you if you're kind of storing things for the long term um you want to make sure that you buy archival tissue paper um regular tissue paper from you know the um you know the craft store or or whatever um from your wrapping paper supply um is fine if you're kind of you know want to pad something for the short term but it that is not acid free or lignin free and so you really want to make sure that it is um from an archival supplier yeah what about using Ziploc bags? Yeah, Ziploc as well, fine for the short term, especially if you're kind of organizing things. Um, I often actually use Ziploc bags if I'm kind of sorting um, a client project and I've got, you know, a whole bunch of these photos over here. I want to just, you know, this stack I want to keep separate. I'll pop them in a Ziploc bag and, you know, it's fine for the short term um, kind of as you're working on a project, but they also are not um, archival and so shouldn't be used for long term storage because the, the acids in those plastics will uh, react with your photos and kind of lead to, to damage more quickly. So you talked about using dental floss. Would mm -hmm. you re recommend that if you have two photos that are stuck together? Uh, yeah, that's a tough one too. Yeah, 
sorry, what were you going to say? Finish that question. Well, will, will dental floss help uh, separate those? Uh, that is tricky. Um, the dental floss really works um, in the the um, the album situation because it's just it's kind of loosening the that sticky adhesive on the back. But when you've got two photos stuck together, like you know, you're never quite sure what the why the, why they're stuck together, right? And this also also goes for photos that you may have framed that are now stuck to the glass. Um, that's often another common problem. So in that case, especially if it's two photos that, um, you know, are, you know, important to you or especially valuable, I might get a professional opinion on getting those separated. Um, you could certainly, I, I know there's lots of tutorials, DIY tutorials online about, um, you know, immersing your photos in water and that will separate them. It helps loosen whatever's sticking them together. But um, I guess kind of from my professional standpoint, I wouldn't, uh, kind of trust a DIY. You know, you never know what how the water is going to react to, um, you know, your photo and and the emulsion layer on top. I just I would I would stay away from trying to do that myself. So the dental floss is fine if you're trying to get you know adhesive you know unstuck off of you know or get a picture out of an album, but two together or an a image stuck to glass, I would get a professional opinion. What's your thoughts on newer apps like uh, for phones like? Uh... I think there's a photo of my knee and uh, a photo of mine. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. And then there's uh, something, uh, you know, that way you can scan photo albums with multiple pictures per page, mm -hmm. and each photo is automatically cropped and stored in an album. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so those are definitely ways to do it. And if you, it's you know, again, it kind of goes along with my mantra of any archival storage is better than none. So any digitization of your photos um, or your albums is kind of better than nothing. Uh, Photomine, um, they're a great organization. I know, um, I know that I've, I've talked to them before. We, um, so we are partners with them. The, the the photo managers at Industry Association, we partner with them, but we don't really recommend them kind of from a professional standpoint. Like I wouldn't use Photomine if you hired me to scan your photos right but they the, the quality scan that you're getting from from using your phone with that app is just not the same as you'd get on a dedicated um kind of optical scanner like a flatbed scanner right so um it's certainly better than nothing and if it's gonna get you to to digitize your photos and get a, a digital copy of them like i'm all for it right and they've got great storage and great sharing options they make it fun and easy so if that's what gets you into digitizing your photos like I'm all for it. Um, but I, I will say that it's not going to be digitized to kind of the archival level that makes it, um, you know, really reproducible down the road. Um, and then what was the other question? Uh, oh, so scanning an album page and then the, and the pictures are kind of pulled out separately. Also super quick and easy. And it actually, you know, it is a viable digital backup of your of your items. And so I'm certainly not going to say no, you shouldn't do it. But it's just not this again, the same um, kind of, uh, you know, best practice from a professional level, um, in terms of the resolution that you'll get from for those photos. So if you have photos, hard artifacts, letters and journals, um, mm -hmm. how do you create a database that crosses them, uh, you know, cross connects them to each other? What would you recommend? Oh, geez. Well, I mean, if you're into making something on, you know, kind of Microsoft Access, uh, that is a potential. Um, you can certainly use, um, there's another program I love called Airtable, which is uh, an online um, kind of cloud-based uh, application that is a little bit, it's like a glorified spreadsheet that has some database capabilities um, for linking spreadsheets. And so um, if, you know, if you don't have the Microsoft suite, I think that is a great option. It's just called Airtable and um, very user-friendly and kind of fun to fun to use. I like it a lot. Um, so I guess that's kind of where I would go with that. There's lots of options for um, kind of more, you know, professional level, museum level, um, you know, collections databases, but usually that's more, um, you know, more, uh, more more capabilities than kind of the average user would need. So I would check out something like Airtable. I would, uh, you know, echo that sentiment because we're using Airtable for the museum. Oh, great. And, yeah. Uh, you know, it's it's free up to a certain yep. Yep. number of, uh, I don't remember how many number of records, records, I think, or something, right? Records. But mm -hmm. if you know how to use Excel, it's mm -hmm. just a glorified Excel, but it has uh, all the search capability, but you can put photos, you can, mm -hmm. um, you know, so somebody can files, wants to yeah. 
look something up, we can just type it in and it'll pull up everything related to that item. So I yeah, and I, it I has would, that a little bit of that relational database part, which is nice too. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Great. I'm glad um, you guys use that. That's super. Yeah. Um, you had mentioned about storing uh, fabrics. So does you did you say that silk should be stored separately or differently from cotton? Yeah. So so silk is considered an animal protein, right? And so it just requires um, uh, being wrapped in a, an unbuffered tissue. Um, so I didn't even get into textiles. I should have had it. That was just there's so many so many things I could have added, right? But um, textiles are, are most um, often stored in kind of bigger boxes, right? Because they're often bigger and you want to store them with the kind of least amount of folds possible because we talked about the folds are where, um, you know, the, the fibers crease and, and are more susceptible to tearing. So storing a, you know, a quilt or dresses or, or whatever garments you have um, with, you know, the least amount of folds, um, lots of archival suppliers sell very kind of much larger textile boxes than any of the boxes you saw in these pictures tonight. Um, and so silks or, um, you know, leather, anything with feathers, um, uh, you want to store in an unbuffered tissue. Um, and then it, it, the box itself will probably be buffered because most archival boxes are that buffered material that absorbs the acids, um, out of the air and out of the objects. Um, but wrapping it in a, uh, a silk garment or something in a, an unbuffered piece of tissue to put in that buffered box is the way to go. It doesn't need to be totally separate. It can be in with other things, just that one layer of, of an unbuffered tissue around uh, anything with animal proteins. Okay. Mm -hmm. what, what would you use to clean oils off of uh, photos that, you know, people have handled for years? What would you yeah think? boy that's not I, i'm not a uh i'd, I'd hesitate to make a, a recommendation on that uh other than kind of um wiping them with a um uh like there's photo cleaning cloths or kind of those you know microfiber um kind of lens cleaning cloths are, are one way to kind of get that off um if you've got something uh, and objects you could use um, like a soft makeup brush or something to kind of do a light dusting um to get um you know more uh, physical things off that doesn't really relate to oils, but for the photos, I would say you know a photo cleaning cloth or um, or a, uh, a microfiber kind of lens cleaning cloth is is a is a good way to go. Um, and I will say there is a, a very good solution. Um, I think it's called PEC twelve, like P E C dash twelve, and it's a it's kind of a super poisonous solvent, I think. But that is excellent for cleaning negatives, like so slides and and negatives. If you need to clean those. Um, I would recommend that solvent, but I don't think that's recommended for prints. So um, I think really just a, you know a physical cloth wipe on a print is is how you want to handle that. So you touched on storing newspapers a little bit, but uh, and putting them in the sleeves. Uh, it, is there like a container? Is a cardboard box okay, or should they have something more, uh, you know, more environmentally protected? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, for for the whole package, if you're going to the length to get a, an archival plastic, you know, a sleeve or a bag for a newspaper, um, you might as well get the archival box too, right? Because you're kind of making that investment in its its protection. So I would put a, a newspaper in a, you know, a, one of those, a bag that fitted or one of those sleeves um, or the clippings going in a sleeve or a, 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 fo a folder, um, you know, an acid-free acid -free folder and then stacking those in an archival box. So, um, yeah, I wouldn't just use any any old cardboard box because that just has so much acid in that cardboard that it's hard for the, so, you know, so you're, you're putting something into, um, you know, a buffered folder, right? And that buffered folder is going to absorb the acids from the box that it's in. So if you're putting something in a super acidy, regular corrugated cardboard box, you're making that buffered folder kind of work overtime to absorb acids because it's, you know, that corrugated cardboard is just off gassing. And so that poor buffered folder that you may be storing your newspaper in is just, it's not going to last as long. It won't be acid free as long because it's absorbing all those acids from the, from the kind of the bad box, if you will. So if you're going to all, you know, the level of, of protecting, you know, newspapers in their own bags, I would say you really should just get uh, an archival box as well. There was a question about storing photos and whether you should take them out of the original frames. Now I know uh, in some cases I've seen where you'd mentioned this, they had, they were in a frame, but they had a, a wood backing on them. 
and mm -hmm. over time that uh, wood started to soak into the picture. Mm -hmm. So they're questioning, should they leave them in the picture in the frames or take them out? Yeah, I, I would say unless the frame is, um, that's a tough one, unless the frame is really part of the, the story of the picture, right? Um, often it's better stored separately. And you can keep the frame if it's important and store that in a box kind of by itself. Um, but uh, yeah, those, wood, those wooden backed frames or really any frame with um, just even the cardboard old backing, um, you know, touching the photo is, is just so not great for the photo. So if you can unframe those, if the frame's important, keep it separately um, and then just get the, get the photo into regular storage um, into a binder with, you know, one of those binder pages or into a, bo a acid free box. Yeah, I would recommend taking them apart. The one time I don't recommend taking things apart is um, when you have a scrapbook um, or you know a photo album where somebody has clearly taken the time to kind of put it together. It's got, you know, maybe there's captions. It's got an order to it um, because the you know the thought process that went into creating that album or that scrapbook is part of its provenance. It's part of its story, right? And so you're losing, if you took it all apart, you're losing so much of what the original, you know, maker uh, put into it and, and losing a lot of its story. And so um, I actually really often, unless it's in such bad condition that it's just, it's kind of impossible to keep together. I recommend keeping um, photos and ephemera clippings and everything in scrapbooks and then as much as you can, protecting them in that scrapbook. I mean, it's, yes, the photos are still going to be on an acidy old paper page, but, you know, if you can put that interleaving over them, you know, at least it protects the front of them. So it's, it's kind of the best you can do while you're keeping, you know, the whole of that important um, kind of scrapbook together. So if it's a frame, I would say take it out um, and, you know, store the frame separately. And then I, if it's a scrapbook or an album, um, and it's not, you know, in terrible, terrible condition, I would say actually keep that together. It's kind of how it's my kind of stance on those two things. <laughs> so uh, CDs and magnetic tape recordings, uh, how long do CDs last? And do you know, uh, how would you preserve magnetic tape recordings? I am not an expert on that. Um, I will just put that out there right now. So I think I've heard that CDs are like, you know, 25 years. It certainly depends on the type. There was uh, for a while, people were marketing these kind of archival gold CDs and, and they were supposed to last much longer. Um, anything that you have on uh, magnetic tape like that, um, or, or even CDs and DVDs at this point um, are probably close to their, uh, you know, usable lifespan on that, that type of media. And so my recommendation kind of for any of that stuff is to, as much as you can get it uh, into a digital format, and then, um, and then just kind of store those originals in acid-free containers, um, you know, whether or not they're wrapped in a plastic bag or they're just inside an archival box is, uh, you know, better storage than they probably were in to start with. Um, and, you know, they, those aren't going to last nearly as long as, um, you know, obviously paper items or even a digital image or a digital file of, of the, you know, the recordings. And so, uh, you know, you could, kind of hope for the best with those but if you can get them digitized kind of as soon as possible I, I think that's the way to go so there's a question they have a a lot of material and they they uh, would prefer to organize them by generation or family or individuals rather than by type but what's your advice on that Oh no! I, I absolutely say whatever whatever organizing strategy makes sense to um, to you to how your brain works to how you want to work to how you're going to access them to how you're going to you know share it down the road. There is no protocol on how to organize. Like I certainly have done it by type. I've done it by by date for people. Um, it's it's totally up to you as long as you're kind of you know, digitizing things and, and, you know, backing things up and, you know, have a consistent file name structure for your digital files and are putting your things in archival boxes, whatever makes sense to you. Absolutely. There's no, no right or wrong way by any means. So, yeah. Can any binder be used or is vinyl not a good thing to use? So vinyl is not great. So, you know, kind of your average office supply store binder is not great, but um, but here's the thing. So again, some archival storage is better than none. So if you have a limited budget, uh, I would spend the money on archival page protectors um, because that is the, the, you know, the, the enclosure that's closest to the object that the object's in, you know, photos or letters or whatever. Um, and then, you know, the binder, you know, if you can afford an archival one, fantastic. But if not, 
you know, at least you've got one layer of protection of archival protection. So it's not the end of the world. Um, you, I mean, I, you just have to be realistic with people's budgets and the, the time to do things and their access to these archival supplies. Everything can't be totally museum quality. So if you've, you know, if you've got the money, you can, and actually, I'll, you know, now I think about it, even some of the full page protectors um, that you can buy, like at Staples or something, um, if you can verify that the, on the box that they're polypropylene, like 100% polypropylene, that's totally archival. So it doesn't need to be from archival methods or any of the other suppliers. Um, not, you know, those boxes won't say that all the time. You know, they may say photo safe or acid free, but unless it's, unless you can actually, you know, see that it's 100% polypropylene, um, which is what most of those page protectors are made out of. Um, you can just, if it's there at Staples, go for it. And then you've actually got an archival solution from Staples. Um, you know, and the binder is, you know, if you can afford an archival one, great. If not, it's not the end of the world. So you've, you know, you've done something by putting it in an archival page protector. Great. Well, thank you, Kate. That, that yeah. answered the last question we had. Uh, this has been great. On Good. the screen, you can see Kate's email again. If you mm -hmm. have any questions for Kate. Yeah, feel uh, free to reach out. I'm ha always happy to talk about projects and, and um, you know, send resources your way. So um, please visit Archival Methods and download that, um, or, you know, click on that preservation guide. It's got uh, lots more kind of details than what uh, we went into tonight. But uh, thanks for the opportunity. And, and hopefully uh, I can connect with you guys uh, when I'm in your part of the state sometime soon. Well, that's great. We'd love to have you. And I want to, you know, invite everyone to our June 14th program. It's the history of ice cream. And uh, we're going to have an ice cream making demonstration, but some really, really interesting background. Uh, Meg Lynch is uh, an expert on uh, making ice cream and that and the, you'd be really surprised at some of the presidents that are connected with ice cream. Uh, so she's, she has quite a story to tell there that if you uh, registered for this program, you will get the link to register for that one as well as the recording for this one. And I wanted to just show you some of the presentations that are coming up. Um, I mentioned the, the ice cream presentation that we have the story of the Statue of Liberty. We have the Civil War Diaries, um, more specific to Sharon Springs. Henry Heinbach is gonna be talking about Jewish life in Sharon Springs. And then a lot of people know about the uh, Adler Hotel. I'll be doing a presentation on that from heyday to what it looks like today. Um, then we've got uh, uh, Pete Lindemann, who's written several, several history books, and he's presenting one of his books so that they, they may just have found James Tanner's legs. A really interesting one in November is the assassination of John F. Kennedy 58 years later, and then the history of Santa Claus. So a lot of good presentations coming up in the next couple of months. There's our address. And uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Again, Kate, we wanna thank you for a wonderful, wonderful presentation. And you will receive the link uh, for the recording. So uh, if you registered for this program, so if there's anything that you missed or you wanted to look back or listen to again, you'll be able to do that. So again, thanks, Kate. And thanks, everyone for participating. Have a great night. Thank you. <laughs> okay.